Hey, how's it going, guys? Good afternoon. So, Chris, I think, yep, okay, we're good. So I'm going to go ahead and shut off my web camera because nobody really wants to see my face during this presentation. So we, that way we can just listen to the dulcet tones of Brian and Bob. So um, once again, my name is Bob McGoy. Um, I'm one of the senior application engineers here with Computer Aided Technology. I've been with the company almost 20 years now. And Brian here, I'll go ahead and let him introduce himself. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Pollock. I'm a senior application engineer. I've uh, been here at least uh, 15 years. Uh, so uh, time quickly goes by, but uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to speak with you and hopefully share some of our uh, extensive knowledge. So, and if we were both clean shaven, it would look like we started here when we were 12. So we, we, had, to, we had to keep the beards on. So a little, little shameless plug here. Um, the extreme SOLIDWORKS Performance Series is uh, stemming from something that we are doing in February at 3D Experience World. And if, if you're going down to Atlanta, Georgia for this presentation, feel free to in, uh, engage with us there. Um, so we're doing a presentation mostly focused on hardware, wouldn't you say, Brian? Uh, yes, yes, lots, so, of, uh, lots of hardware testing. I, I, th I think we might do some a uh, small talk about some hardware things in January, maybe, depending on how we do. We're doing some testing for 2022 on, on SOLIDWORKS with some new hardware we've gotten from our, our good friends at Dell, Box, AMD, um, NVIDIA. Um, they've been kind supporters of this presentation over the last few years. Um, Brian's been working with all these vendors, so it's 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 been a it's been a fun time. Absolutely, they've been uh, a key part of uh, everything that we uh, we do and and study. So, so, so with with this, when when we talk about performance, we typically think about there being two aspects of that, and there is hardware performance. When we say hardware, we mean the physical computer that you are running upon. So this is something that is near and dear to Brian's heart. He has spent countless, I, I, I literally can't count the hours, and I think his wife wants to throw every computer in his house out of the house. Um, but he's been running benchmarks that we've baked in-house on models. And the idea is at the end of the day, we'll help you make educated decisions based upon what makes most financial sense for you and also impacts SOLIDWORKS performance. The other aspect of this is modeling. We do this on a regular basis and sometimes we everything is going just fine and then sometimes it's not and we'll, we'll talk about some of that. Go ahead, Brian. All right, so it doesn't matter whether we're dealing with uh, industry equipment or something as what simply looks like a sewing machine. Uh, when you peel back that cover, it's actually quite elaborate underneath there. But uh, as Bob said, uh, there are lots of factors. There are lots of sizes of assemblies and lots of, lots of little things that add up into these performance problems. And so we're gonna show you, uh, you know, what do we do when it is fine and it does take that, that big dive? You know, what are the tools, what are the questions um, that you guys have at your disposal? And I, I usually say in, at this point in time, um, when that when our performance jumps off the clip, you're like, what the heck? And the evil monkey shows up and says, ha, 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 ha your model's not performing correctly anymore. So the question comes up is this. What do I do now? So we, we've got to ask some questions uh, because we got to drill down on what type of issues are you experiencing? So what are the assembly load times? What are the rebuild times? Are we having pan, zoom, rotate? Is it graphics? Uh, is it the mouse responsiveness, All right? So these are the questions we got to start evaluating uh, so that we can narrow in on what aspect uh, of the the issue we're, we're drilling into. And these these are the things that uh, CATI and, and your sport teams uh, can help you 
uh, do. So a couple of tools that we do have, uh, we have the performance evaluation tool, and it's a report uh, built inside of SOLIDWORKS, and the assembly visualization tool. So these tools have both been in there for uh, a number of years, uh, but have certainly gotten some uh, big enhancements over the years um, and provide us a lot of valuable information. So the first one is the evaluation tool. Uh, the easiest place to find that is gonna be right on your evaluate toolbar. Uh, just about the middle of your screen, uh, we got the performance evaluation report and you, you'll find this in any assembly file. So I'm gonna go ahead and hop, actually, Brian, I didn't tell you I was gonna do this, but I'm actually going to hop over to SOLIDWORKS. Um, is, can everybody see that? Maybe, uh, Chris, can you see that okay? I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming everybody can see that. Yeah, okay, I got gotcha. you. So Looking good, what we have here is a very detailed sewing machine. And when I mean detailed, I mean it is, it's a little detailed and it's built that way for a purpose, okay? So let's go ahead and we're gonna go over to our evaluate command, just like we saw on that slide. And I'm gonna turn on the text labels here so we can see all this. So we've got the performance evaluation tool and the assembly visualization tool. They both have their places, but I'm gonna go through and show you performance evaluation tool first. Let's go ahead and make sure that this is right here, nice and on the screen. So when we look through this, it gives us some nice, really nice information. First of all, it gives us an open summary to say, well, if I'm looking at assembly load times, are there any particular files that are taking longer than others? And you can scroll down through this and you can see that list. What I really like here is being able to hit that show these files. I'll pull that over and it's showing me the top offenders for that. Now I can come in here and I can grab each individual one and I can say, open them up in their own screen, which is actually kind of nice. Over the years, they've added some really good enhancements to this tool. Before it just give us a big long te you know, text information, but we'd have to kind of take screenshots of it and dump it out. But now you can hit save on that and you can save that as a, a text file, which is just common delimited. And you can save that to your desktop. Now, Coming down here, you can see that it lists out that if there are any previous versions of the files, that is something that we wanna know about because every time we load a SOLIDWORKS model, if it's in a previous version, it has to be converted into the newest version before it actually officially opens. So if you've got a file that's been opened and was created in SOLIDWORKS 99 and hasn't been converted, it's going to take a little bit for that file to cycle up and, and open up correctly. Well, and don't forget, Bob, there was that file conversion uh, change in 2015. There you go. There was that file conversion change. So there, there are some things that, that help out with that as well. So do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, yeah. So they changed the uh, compression method uh, of, that they used in the background of the files. It kind of helps protect some of the internal data of the files. Mm -hmm. But we also saw... Um, significant file reduction. Oh yeah, that's right, we did, didn't we? We saw saw in some files was a 50 to 70% reduction in file size. Mm -hmm. And that was because it was a complete database change. It was how it stored that data in there. It actually compressed it quite a bit. I think, I think before they were using a lossless compression, then they went to like an LZW compression, which compressed it down nicely. LZW is kind of a, a, a nerdy way of saying they use kind of a zip file behind the scenes. At previously. So the next thing here is display performance. When we start getting to pans, rotation, zooms, um, how soon I click on the mouse and I drag and then SOLIDWORKS responds, those can typically be related to graphics. Uh, another thing to be related to graphics is when you're creating a drawing view inside of a drawing, that will also be applicable there as well. But what we're looking for here is which one of these is generating the most graphics triangles? So, so a, a lot of people don't realize that we're not looking at the perfect CAD model on screen. We're actually looking at a shaded representation of the mathematics behind there. 
So SolidWorks is making a bunch of small flat triangles, shading them and smooth them out with some sort of shader behind the scenes. I don't know the math behind it, don't care. It looks similar to a uh, step file. Yeah. Or an step, SD, 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 SDL, SDL file. It looks like something that you would 3D right. print. So what this kind of gives us the indication of is what files have the highest level of detail in them? So what has the most features? What has the most faces? So those are things that we want to go look at. So you could come over here and say, well, let's go look at that file, open it up in its own window and see, well, what's going on there? Now, a lot of times, as you see here, it actually opens up behind that yep. window. So you have to close your report. So I close it out. And you have to change your window. And lo and behold, it's a spring. Okay. Um, I can't think of much geometry in the world that is harder to calculate than a helical based piece of mathematics. So this, I personally would probably just put two cylinders, an, inter, an, ind, an OD and an ID around that and just extrude that through because unless you really need to see it, it's not going to do us much, much benefit there. Well, actually, um, what's really cool is depending on how much detail you do need, you can actually come about 80% of the way through that wall. Exactly. And only show that exterior surface. But if we can, uh, we can also use uh, decals. So we can uh, do a cylindrical representation, throw a decal on there, and uh, get a very close uh, representation to a spring. So with graphics triangles, another thing that we want to look at is this little report right here. I love this because now we have something that we can save and go back to and see what are the biggest offenders when it comes to level of detail in the model. Um, some of them can't be helped, um, but if if we can spend a little bit of time in cleaning those up, it makes life a little bit easier in the long run. So well, we can we talk work about from yeah. we work from the top down, yep. and that's going to be your biggest return. Yep. So if we can reduce those files at the top of the list, uh, those are going to be the most noticeable um, and give us that that quick satisfaction of improvement. So rebuild times, there really wasn't much in way of any red flags here, but sometimes this will expand out and you might have, like it says, there's 446 mates in the top level of this assembly. Um, we have no circular references found. I, I like that. That'll, that actually adds to long rebuild times, sometimes problems with packing goes and that sort of thing. So we don't want to do that. So let's go ahead and minimize that one down. And let's move back up, uh, jump back up to your uh, graphics uh, before we move too far on. Uh, this report doesn't have it because there's no offending files, but uh, right. we also, uh, the system will flag us yes. for medium high and high quality. Right. So inside of SOLIDWORKS, there is, if I grab a hold of a file here, and we'll show you this in the, in the slide deck here in a second too. So if I come over to my system options, there is a... Under document properties, there's this, I was playing around with this file earlier. I, I reset them all down to 20. Of so, course you did. Yep. So right here, this controls the amount of triangles that are getting generated. So if I go to the left, you can see that. So, sorry, just making sure that we weren't having problems there. You can see that it's taking a perfect circle and reducing it down to something that's not knit discernible as a circle anymore. But the more that we make this go to the right, the more triangles are actually, more flat triangles are being mapped onto that. So we'll talk about this option here in a second. But typically our standard SOLIDWORKS templates are right about, was it 46? 46%. 46%. So and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. So coming back to the report, there would actually be one here about, was it image quality, it says? Yeah, it's image quality, medium medium high would be anything right in the middle of that slider. Yep. Uh, very high is all the way toward that right end, toward yeah, that red zone. you don't want to be near the red line. That is someplace um, you do not want to be. And the appearances there, uh, we can see that the system is flagging us for uh, colors applied over 100 faces. Yes. And... Where this is a good thing to know about is, make a long story short here, the video cards themselves, when they when they render these models, will treat 
the files differently if certain uh, a certain number of faces are unique in their appearances. So that can adversely affect your pan, rotate, zoom, your responsiveness of the models. So if you've got some parts that have a lot of appearances in it, it looks like there might have been 375 faces on that file and they all got individually colored somehow. That Correct. may have been an import or something. So something to take a look at, but it's easy to go in there and grab a hold of those faces and remove all that face color in one shot. R remove it, apply it to the feature or the body uh, as opposed to the individual faces. So another thing here, it's, it's kind of giving us a, a, a flag saying that this file has 327 components in it. And right now your threshold for using large assembly mode, which is a very nice tool, is set to 500. So it's not going to kick in right now. So it's saying you're under that, that threshold. Now, personally, if I was running, say, like, like a Lenovo ThinkPad or something that maybe doesn't have as much horsepower as some of the machines that you and I are running, um, you might lower that to 250. So yeah, default out of the box is 500. Yep, sure is. So that's where you need to figure out for you, what is that number that says on my, my piece of hardware, that's a large assembly. So the next area is just general statistics about the assembly itself, not the piece parts of that assembly. So we, you can see here that we have 327 components in this assembly, um, be that parts and sub-assemblies. We've got, what is it, 162 unique assemblies, I mean components. Right, you have unique configuration, so that you have 208 unique files. Yep. So, so the interesting thing is, Brian, you took this sewing machine and you you did an array of this sewing machine as just just a practice, right? That's something we are studying. We okay. are studying the effects of uh, the number of components versus the number of unique components. Right. And we're studying that versus the amount of RAM, uh, the amount of time uh, for our benchmark. So it's very uh, <laughs> it's a very sizable study. It's, um, it's definitely something we're going to have a blog article out here probably uh, would you we'll say see. before SOLIDWORKS World maybe? Might have a short one. Okay. So it was basically talking about you have identical components, but they're unique file names. And because they're unique file names, they render the RAM as completely separate things. So, so that's something to take in consideration. Um, the other thing here is kind of big for us is how many top level mates are you solving? And we'll, we'll talk about that. So one of the big takeaways there is number of evaluated top level mates. You want to check that out. Okay. So at the end of the day, we can come over here and I could skip directly to assembly visualization, but I'm not. But I can also save this whole thing out as a report and deliver this to somebody if I needed to. So I'm going to go ahead and grab a hold of, I'm just looking here. The triangle is supposed to be calculated. OK, somebody was asking a question at the audits. I just want to make sure I wasn't missing yep. something. So let's pop back over to the slide deck here. So just kind of a, so you can see here, um, this was a screenshot that I took yesterday before I saved that assembly. You can see I had um, at the bottom 176 of the 177 files were saved in a previous version of SOLIDWORKS. So it tells you that. Also, remember, once you get in that performance tool, leverage, and you can see right here, that was the image quality that I had just adjusted this morning. I used a macro to go through and change them all. Um, so you can always save these out and use those as a plan of attack of things that you need to go back and do edits. These usually don't take too much time, but it's, it's nice to be able to have a list to go back to. Right. Anything that, priorities. It's yeah. all, it's all setting priorities. Yep. So Brian, this is actually an output from, um, these assembly, um, performance tool that you worked with on a customer with, right? Correct, correct. So this uh, customer uh, came to us and, and we took a look. So we have about just under a 5,000 part assembly. Um, they've got about 630 unique parts. So that's pretty on average. 
Okay, but uh, it's a 5,000 part assembly with 11,000 bodies. Uh, so lots of multi-bodies, lots, probably lots of imported geometry. Um, and so, at the assembly level, um, we've got 566 mates uh, at the top level. Oof. So that's okay. pretty pretty hefty up there. So, and we'll, we'll talk about why, why that's hefty here in a second. But to, to me, just looking at those numbers, the number of bodies versus the number of components, that's kind of a, a, a flag to me as, as a saw wrench user that I've got quite a few multi-body parts, which also says I probably have lots of downloaded components that I don't design that I put into my assembly. And typically that's where we see performance issues and hits. Yeah, and a lot of people think about uh, assemblies. They save assemblies as a part file and the multi-body. In, in an assembly, a multi-body is really treated like an assembly. We have to calculate each one of those bodies. Right. So we're not saving anything by dumping it into a part file. Yeah, because then you're negating all that, the ability for it to look at a part file and say, well, I've got five instances of that part file in there. I'm, I'm only going to load one of them in RAM. So there are some, I mean, there are some arguments yeah. um, because now you might have one of those purchase components and it's a single file. Yep. Um, so there are certainly some arguments uh, for why we might do that. But a lot of uh, a lot of people thought, you know, are under the mindset that, that they can save it out as a single part file and that makes it better. So, and this is just one step further. This is that graphics triangle count for that, that assembly. Um, Brian, I, I felt like I needed to redact it. <laughs> <laughs> for not only the customer safety, but my safety. So um, if, if go ahead and, and talk about this guy here. Right. So we, we take that list and we tally it out. We dumped out into Excel and we took a look and, and total assembly had 22 million graphic triangles. So that is a lot of work that our graphics have to do. So then we break this down in, and rank it, you know, by the top offending files and the top 11 files. Uh, accounted for six and a half million graphic triangles. That's a lot. So one third of your assembly was was being affected by 10 or 11 files in this case. And, and typically with the engagements that you, you and I have with customers, we typically find that it's usually that that 5% of the assembly that affects 100% of the assembly's performance. So the nice thing about that is it's not usually every file. It's just spending some time with some of those those files that are causing that assembly to kind of hop off the cliff to bring it back to a good performance. Right, exactly. If we, ta if we tackle that top 10% of the assembly, uh, we can, a lot of the times we can, we can start reeling it back down into a more usable state. So I just threw this up here so you kind of recap what we find in, the, in that tool. Right, so um, obviously we know the load times. Uh, we get that right off the top of the report. Uh, tells us about the older version files. Uh, again, once those are converted and saved, then we don't have to do that conversion every time. Um, we get the graphic triangles, uh, that's affected by the image quality, and then we, we break down and we can see the assembly stats. Sounds good. So now this one's near and dear to my heart because I think it was about, I think SolidWorks 2014, when this tool came out, but it was just for visualizing the assembly itself with custom properties and that sort of thing. And I ended up finding that there's a bunch of extra properties that you could actually cleave out of it. And one of those was total graphics triangles. So it gave me a way to see all the graphics triangles of an assembly because that wasn't in the performance tool. It, they didn't push that over until later. So let's take a look at Assembly visualization, one right. of my favorite tools here. So this was definitely was one of those uh, early on tools that we used to cleave the data out um, long before SOLIDWORKS uh, gave us that nice report. So give it a second here. And you'll see by default, it's gonna give you mass. It's gonna give you quantity and it's color coding it. What I like about this tool is if you come down here at the bottom, you can add and adjust colors and watch this dynamically update. So if I just want to see information about the top few components, I can grab that, drag it up, 
if I want to say, I can go from the top down, maybe I don't care about the top two components, I can suppress those, and then I can go to the bottom and say, well, let's, let's go from the bottom up. And I grab the rollback, I have a rollback bar at the top and the bottom, and it allows me to start digging into the middle range of the files. So I'm gonna right click on that rollback bar there and I'm gonna roll that to the end. So it's unsuppressing it. And then I'm gonna roll this to the top. I love that they put roll to the top, which yeah. is, is nice. So previously the way we do this is I would come over here and I would go to more. And that allows me to cleave out any SOWERS custom property available. Now it's not just properties that are baked into SOLIDWORKS, it's also the meta properties that you put in. So you can see there, I ran our own custom assembly evaluation tool that we use to evaluate assemblies for our customers. And you can see I've got file locations, last saved with graphics triangles, image quality number. I can search on those, but baked into SOLIDWORKS for everyone to get their hands on is total graphics triangles. So if I do that and hit OK, you can see now total graphics triangles is right here and I can see the largest vendors and sort by those quantities. So you can see I'm actually getting a graphical representation here. Now, I believe they did this, I think in 20, was it 2018 or 2017, Brian, they added the performance analysis tool. I believe it was 2018. Because what they did was they added in custom properties baked into the SOLIDWORKS header of the last time it was open and what his rebuild time was. So now I can come in here and I can see all the files that have the total graphics triangle count. I can sort by longest open. But what I really love about this is now, if this was an assembly that maybe you're just new to the company and you're like, what are the heavy hitters in this assembly? I grab that rollback bar and I probably just right, should have right clicked on it and said, maybe I just want to see the top few files. Now I have a visual cue for me, just being able to look at it and say, okay, these are the ones that are hitting out so hard. So I can continue coming in here. And you see, it's that spring we were talking about earlier. See another spring. And you just start rolling down and you see one of our mutual buddies at SOLIDWORKS modeled this off of his daughter's broken sewing machine. So you can see he, he went, spared no expense to the level of detail here. But now we're getting to some plastic parts. Well, that's gonna be molded, so we, we really don't need to worry about that. But we start coming down through here and do I need, need the springs for the manufacturing process to make that? No. So. But at the end of the day, I can come in here and do a save as and save that as a bill of material. And then just like in the performance evaluator, we have that ability to go back and get to it. So lots and lots of additional uses of the visualization tool. You can add, uh, what is it, five columns. You can yes. save that template out um, so that you don't have to set it up every time. Um, but uh, a, a lot of great uh, uses just even beyond these types of performance uh, evaluations. So, so I mean, many, many times when, you, when you're looking for the heaviest components in your assembly, that's where this tool comes into play really nicely. So, and I'm, I'm more of a, give me something visual to digest. Some people just like to have that Excel spreadsheet that they can cleave the data that way. It's up to you how you want to go about doing it. It is a dynamic list. You do have to have the assembly fully uh, resolved. Yeah. Um, yep. And when you make adjustments to the file, it will reorder. Yes, it does. So if I were to cut half, half the geometry out of one of the parts, it would automatically rebuild and reorder that custom property, which is nice. Just makes it hard when you're trying to track that part. <laughs> yeah, it does. But that's just, that's just in the assembly visualization tool. That's not in the tree, though. So things you'll find, we talk about total, you can get just graphics triangles by themselves. Total graphics triangles is if I have that component in there, but I have it in 13 times, 
it's the total number of the number of instances of that component in there. I prefer to have that one, but you can also add if I just see a single file because it might be in there 125 times. And sometimes that's uh, the number, the, the total number is very large just because that's the math. Yep. The, so the individual triangle count can be low on the part, but because of the high number of instance counts. So I, I had a customer I was working with one time and they were actually using SOLIDWORKS Composer. They weren't using SOLIDWORKS, but they were complaining about performance issues. And I said, well, let's go back and look at the source model itself. So we popped over to SOLIDWORKS and I'm looking at this, I'm like, this is just a box with some Mitsumi extruded aluminum profiles in it. This, this shouldn't be any problem. Maybe it's some Mitsumi profiles, maybe we fill those in. It wasn't the Mitsumi profiles. It was a T-nut that had a helicoil insert in it that they had downloaded. And it had the internal and external thread and the T-nut itself where the helicoil went into it also had the thread. Each one of those contributed 100,000 triangles to the assembly and it was in the assembly 197 times so you can imagine why that that assembly that should have been more like 2 million triangles was more like 14 million triangles so by going in and removing those threads that that assembly was whistling dixie i mean it, it was it was going really nice so load times and rebuild times those those are more like not not just geometry, their features. It's, it's like, how's my feature stacking up? Do I have a lot of holes in something? Those, those are things that can kind of go along with the graphics triangles, but it's just another indicator of these are models that we need to go look at. But the graphic triangles will definitely, uh, decreasing the graphic triangles decreases the file size. Yep, it sure does. And it will also increase the load times. Yes, so speed us, speed it up for us. And these, I, I apologize, Brian. We were we were showing these to a, a coworker earlier. These are just recapping some of the things you can do right there inside of the tool. But so the question is, when we start finding these files, what do we do? So here's one right, of those so files uh, on an assembly. Absolutely. Uh, so this is a very typical uh, downloaded component. Uh, it's going to be a purchase component uh, from any number of suppliers. Uh, it had 15 uh, solid bodies in it, uh, and that and it contributed to 117,000 graphing triangles. And by the time we dug into it, you know, we found out that the, uh, all the screw fasteners had full helical threads in them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have uh, washers, a lot of times washers, maybe you have split washers, uh, things like that. Uh, so we reduced this, we merged uh, the bodies down, deleted bodies. Uh, we got it down to one solid body and we dry, we cut that 117 down to 20, just under 29,000 graphic triangles. Yeah, and honestly, we just put the screws in and merged them into that block because we found out that they weren't showing an assembly process for those screws. The other thing and we have to watch out for is, is a lot of these parts are hollow. Yes. It, they have so you're calculating internal geometry yep and that's stuff you you're never going to see and a small switch like this is probably buried inside of an assembly somewhere so we don't see that detail anyways we don't care about that detail right we're purchasing it from some from some vendor and we're dropping it in there so we can uh, merge all that uh, internal data out uh, we've got a couple different methods of doing that uh, but that significantly cuts down those graphic triangles so what you're telling me is download or beware Absolutely. They, well, when you think about it, any company that puts a product on the market wants their model, wants their geometry to be accurate and look really good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they, they're going to put as much detail in there to make their part look good so that you, you use it and you buy it and it looks exactly like what you're going to get. Right. It, it goes back to that study we read that 80% of the time, if you can get your widget into someone else's design, they're going to order your widget. So... Make sure you can get your widgets out there. Just don't make them so detailed that you're like this next one. Um, this file um, is, I, I see this on a regular basis. It's kind of the bane of my existence. It's been around since SOLIDWORKS 1999. Um, it's, it's an online download file, but it is a fastener that has a faux helical thread. It's not a real helical thread, 
But the problem was in Brian's assembly there, um, it had 56 of those and it contributed a half million polygons. It's in that top top 11 components to that. Now, if we took that down and removed that and put a, a actual thread call out on it that had the graphics triangles, I'm not, not graphics, it just had a JPEG on it, it would still be called out when you look at it from a drawing and the reduction would have went down to less than 3000 for the whole 56 pieces. Yeah, a lot of times, um... just lost my thought. Oh, no yeah. worries. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. yeah, when you take a fastener, right? You, what do we do with them? We stick them in a block. Yep. But every time you rotate your model, it's got to calculate all of that geometry. Doesn't matter if it's internal, uh, it's kind of buried inside of a, a yep. hole. Uh, all that, all those triangles have to, to generate, regenerate every time you rotate. Yep. Now, I, I will say you and I have had conversations with, with Sid at SolidWorks. He's, he's the guy that did that new performance pipeline tool. He's constantly trying to make it better and better. But at the end of the day, he's, he's not going to be able to fix so much level of detail that is in that sort of that component. So, so one of the things, number one off the list, we're, we're talking about removing detail. And one of the things we also need to do is do a tools check. And the reason why we do a tools check is like Brian said, sometimes you get models that are hollow or maybe they've got inconsistencies. Geometry that um, has faulty geometry inside of it can cause long rebuild times as well. Um, Just because a model says it's solid doesn't, doesn't mean, mean it's not geometry problems. Yep. Now there's a couple tools here and we'll probably send some links out to these. We got some some blog articles about these tools. I think Chris might be able to even throw some out there. Um, D feature. D feature has been enhanced and developed over the last few years to allow you to take models that maybe they're an import and allow you to reduce that down into something that's a little bit more manageable without giving away the IP of that file. Absolutely, it's got uh, both uh, part uh, functionality and assembly functionality. Yep. Um, so they've really enhanced the usability, especially on the assembly side yep. uh, with silhouette selections and, and uh, makes it really nice and usable. So that, that would definitely be one that I, I would take a look at, especially if you need to start removing some data. Especially if you haven't looked at it, it, was, it came out in 2011. Mm -hmm. so it's been around <laughs> 10 years you know if you if maybe when you looked at it it was limited when when uh, we first looked at it yep. so if you haven't used that tool in a while go back and take a look at it there's a lot of enhancements that came out especially a couple of years ago the next one i recommend for looking at when you're removing levels of detail is a simplify command you're you're not building a new model with data removed you're it's actually you can take an assembly and you can say i want to find all features within a certain volumetric area and actually suppress those. And what it'll do, it automatically creates a new configuration of that part and you can typically call it simplified. Um, this this one's been around actually longer than the feature. A lot of people don't know yeah. about it. Very, very underutilized tool. Uh, so this is kind of a little hidden gem. So what are the things I like to do is I will go through and use a simplify on a part. Then after I'm done using simplify on a part, I will use one of my favorite opening techniques inside of SolidWorks here to make my life easier. So this one we didn't discuss, Brian, but it popped in my head, so I might as well show it. So if I go ahead and grab a hold of this sewing machine right here, and I go into configurations, there's an advanced inside of carrots. Absolutely. Yep. So what this allows me to do, and we've done this a lot in support, if you ever get a failed to open document on an assembly, use this, okay? What this will allow you to do is you can say, I want to, Either open with, if you have specified configuration called simplified, 
which I use in the quote unquote simplify command, it will look for that configuration and use that one. So now, that's all about using a consistent naming convention. Yep. So now for an assembly that's maybe not opening, you can come in here and say, um, I'll just call it opener. So I'm gonna generate a temporary configuration of that assembly and just open the structure only. The assembly opens instantly. Looks great, I'll design around it. Wait, there's nothing there. And that is because we just opened the structure. We didn't load anything. So right click, I can start unsuppressing things. By doing this, you can start walking your way down the tree. And then when you hit file fail to open, you know which file was actually the problem. A lot of times these assemblies uh, that don't open are, uh, can be a single file. Yes. And sometimes that file just requires a rebuild. Yes. So in that situation, you can start walking down the tree and open that data up. And that even that bobber, bobbin assembly looks, looks pretty dope. <laughs> so then there's brute force. So sometimes you look at it, and Brian, you, you, you can attest to this. Yeah, you just gotta go in. Uh, sometimes it's uh, sometimes we got knit surfaces and do some manual modeling. Sometimes we're just going in there, deleting bodies, ripping stuff out, uh, round tripping. Yes, uh, round tripping the file. Uh, and round tripping is is a technique where, especially with imported geometry, that we're gonna do some a bunch of work on it. We're gonna save it back out to a step file or or an uh, I just file. Uh, sometimes uh, we mix that up because we get a little different results. Yep. And then we import it back in. Now it, SOLIDWORKS thinks it's a new file. Yep. Uh, and then we can run the import diagnostics again. Yep. Uh, and we can try to get the software to help patch up some more geometry for us. And on, on nasty complex parts, we might do this six, eight, 10, 12 times. Yep. And the, the reason why we, we do the round trip to like an IGES or something is um, I'm 43 years old. I hate to say that, but um, I just is 44 years old. I just started out as a 2D format and it didn't get 3D added until the late 70s, early 80s when the format was finally added in. The problem with it is when they wrote the standard, they wrote it so loosely that there was no standard for how the surfaces were supposed to knit together. For the longest time inside of SOLIDWORKS, you could export an IGES file out of SOLIDWORKS as 27 different formats of an IGES file, which would be different tolerances of, of exporting like nits and vertices and that sort of thing. So that's why when we do a round trip, we use IGES because there's more healing that we do with an IGES file because we know that it's, it's garbage in, garbage out. We're trying to help that IGES file along. So we mentioned this earlier, level of detail slider. Can't stress enough that SOLIDWORKS and Brian and I have had the conversation with them. If, if, if anybody would do me a favor and Brian a favor today, if you're putting any enhancement request in, ask SOLIDWORKS to dial back the default templates from 46 to say maybe 25. Yeah, 20, 25. That, 20, that would be, that'd be great because you're not gonna see any negligible difference because that's where it's at by default. And that's really where we want it to be. And the, the reason for that is what we see here with this graph on the left-hand side. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, uh, the, the original assembly uh, files we put at 95% uh, level of detail. So we crank that slider all the way over to the right end. And level of detail is a double whammy because it affects part files and the assembly file. And rebuilds actually. So you you have you have a setting in both your part template and your assembly template. Yep. So reducing it down to our 20%, uh, we reduced the file size by 85 megs, and we increased our opening time by 18%. Yep. So we made it 18% faster by just making sure that those were at a reasonable level instead of where they were at. So. Top level mates, and I'm shameless plug for this man, uh, Jeff Jeffrey. Um, 
I saw this rule of thumb sketch online and I had to share it with everybody because I just thought it was cool. So try to keep your mates at or below 300 mates solved at the top level. So this it, is always a big question to us. How many mates is too many? Yes. Right. And and this is not a, a hard rule. It's not provided by SOLIDWORKS. Uh, but when you think about it, we know that to lock down a component, to take away all degrees of freedom, it takes three mates. Yep. So if you take three mates and you multiply it by the number of components you have, so if you have 100 parts at the top level, you're going to be at 300 mates. Yep. And the, the, the big reason why this is so is mates aren't solved in serial. serial. They're not solved in parallel. They're solved simultaneously, all at the same time. It's creating a matrix of interconnected web types digital connections between each other. And once you start hitting over 300, it's been this way for like the last 20 years. Once you hit that 300 mark, things start falling off that cliff. And they're, they're starting to work on that, it's starting to get better. But how do, we, how do we reduce some of that? Well, there's patterns inside the assembly. Use, if you've already done pattern features inside your parts and you're gonna put the same component in those holes, there's a, there's a feature called, what is it? feature driven component pattern. So you can insert one part into one of the holes of that part. And then you say, execute the pattern and then pick any face of the pattern and it'll automatically populate another instance of that part in the, in the, in the rest of the pattern off that part. It's a big time saver too. It's a huge time saver. You don't have to do copy with mates, that sort of thing. Flexible sub assemblies. If you're using flexible sub assemblies, they will solve at the top level. So you might say to yourself, well, I only have 23 mates in my mates folder. Well, you've got two flexible sub-assemblies that have 30 components in each one of them. All of a sudden, I've got 500 mates. So flexible is definitely one that we run across a lot yeah. um, because it gives you that full movement. But as it does, we, we do everything, and we've, we've got customers that do it right, and they, they use sub-assemblies and push those mates down into in sub-assemblies. SOLIDWORKS calculates that differently. Because yep. it's not up at the top level. But when you when you set that flexible, all the mates of that subassembly now get solved at that top level. Yep. So I worked on a company with that made an aileron, uh, a large plane aileron. And they had about 300 mates at the top level. Um, it was about a 1,500 part assembly, very large. Uh, to do that, they had 73 flexible subassemblies. So they were solving 1,500 mates every time you rotate that part. Okay, I can see where that probably fell off a cliff. So now, if you start getting a ton of components at that top level, you can use sub-assemblies and group those together. Now, where this usually comes into problem is, hey, I don't wanna mess with my bill of materials. Well, inside of SolidWorks, I think I actually closed SolidWorks out, that's funny. Um, Inside of SOLIDWORKS, if you go to the configuration properties of that subassembly, there's an option in there for promote. And what promote does is when that subassembly is in your top level, it treats it like every component in that subassembly is actually at the top level for bill of material purposes. So that should not be an excuse for you to go ahead and not use subassemblies. And subassemblies give us the ability to not open the whole thing. Right, so you can open a smaller chunk of the assembly. Uh, so, so every day you don't have to open the top level. Yep. And then we can do more with simplification. So you can make a simplified configuration, group things down, um, yep. and, and just easier, easier management of the files all the way around. So we got a few more minutes here, so I think we're gonna have to start going to turbo mode here. Um, shameless plug, number four. Myself, Brian, computer-aided technology, we can help you out. And how do we do that? Um, we have tools that we've written in house that Brian works with on a daily basis. Yeah, we have uh, we have a proprietary benchmarking tool. Uh, this is what we uh, test our hardware with, um, and we can get engaged. We can test um, uh, your hardware. We can do comparatives. This tool is also built that we can run it on any assembly. So we specifically wrote it uh, so that we could test customer data sets. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can compare it. You know, it's, it's hard because assemblies are not all the same. 
Yep. Um, geometry, you have you have very geometric geometry, you have very ergonomic curvy geometry, right? So so um, you can't always say it's apples to apples, but it gives us an idea. Right. And at the end of the day, we've also wrote tools that allow us to show you what we had before and what we had after the fact. And, and we're constantly uh, working to uh, enhance those tools, build more tools, um, and it can give us a quick snapshot, uh, much like the reports uh, that, that SOWERX has, but we take it a step further. Yeah, spend a lot of time. Brian and I were actually writing down enhancements to that tool that I'm probably gonna be writing here in the next couple of weeks because I think they're really cool. So we got a few more minutes here. So if if you guys want to know more about that that service, feel free to reach out to our ourselves or um our sales rep or sales rep and we can we can talk to you more about this. But basically at the end of the day, we can sh run your model through that benchmark tool and then do do some edits to it and then show you based upon those changes what impact was it. Um a couple best practices things here just to reiterate going back to my rule of thumb so mates for assemblies keep those below 300 top level to a minimum yep so try to remove excessive detail by looking at that evaluation tool as 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 assemblies get bigger the less detail you need uh keep that level of detail down to 20 20 or 25 percent you know uh that it's a, that's about that fourth tick mark from that left end and at the end of the day, beware of downloads. If you download something, just understand what is it? What am I what am I using that for? And is the level of detail excessive? If it is, there's ways that you can remove that in a short period of time. Um, it's just many times some of us just want to get our job done. And you also have to have to try to get those surface models converted to solid. Yes. Surface models can can be a bane of your existence. So it's definitely something that you want to work getting towards a solid model. Even if you need to model a a very prismatic representation of that around it to, to get it working. So a couple things that require no time of your own. Settings inside of SolidWorks. Use, a, use large assembly mode. Uh, if you have large assemblies, this kicks in by default. It's on by default out of the box. Uh, kicks in at 500 components. Uh, it's it's a series of settings in the background that they they're going to help turn off. It's going to turn on lightweight mode. Uh, lightweight mode um, is separate from large assembly mode, but it's coupled together. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to reduce the uh, the data that gets loaded into your feature tree. So you're going to see a little feather on your on your components, uh, but you're not going to see all the features of those components. And a lot of people have shied away from this. They like to turn this function off because to work on an assembly, you had to resolve any component you wanted to work on. And that was kind of a, a burden, an extra step. And we didn't like to do that, load and unload that data. Well, SOLIDWORKS has enhanced that for us. And in 2022, that data auto resolves. So as I click in the tree, SOLIDWORKS is resolving that data behind the scenes. So I no longer have to right click and resolve my components. And if some of your assemblies are what I call ginormica, um, sometimes you just wanna get them open extremely fast. There's a tool when you open it up called Large Design Review. And Large Design Review will open that assembly with the preview data, with the assembly structure, but doesn't load any of the features that made that sort of thing. It's all graphics. It's all graphics. But there are things that you can do in that tool. You can you can go and make copies. You can you, now I think you can add mates, but there's quite a few things that you can do in large design review to make your life easier. Absolutely. Then that's a function they're definitely continuing to enhance a year over year. They're giving us more and more functionality in there. This is great when you're uh, in that meeting. Yep. You got to pull this up for your boss. And you know, some of these large assemblies can easily take five to seven to ten. Uh, minutes to open, um, and you don't have that time. You know, your boss comes in the room, he wants to see that data. So pop it open in large assembly mode or large design review. Yep. And uh, it's on screen. You can you can interact with it and uh, probably get get what you need. So detailing mode. 
Um, I, I love awesome, this thing. awesome enhancement. Um, if 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 you're like me and you've done mold design in the past or like Brian done it too, um, drawings can be very hefty when you're doing die sets and multi cavity and ejector pins and that sort of thing. So detailing mode will open that drawing up extremely fast. You don't have to worry about the model behind the scenes loading up and you get right into doing what you need to do, which is look at that drawing and update it. Right. So there's a couple limitations here. Uh, the, uh, this was introduced in 2021 mm -hmm. um, and you have to save your drawing into that version. Um, in 21, uh, you are limited. Uh, you cannot create detailed views. You cannot create a new view. You can't create section views. Uh, that, that part has been added. Yep. Uh, 2022, again, enhancing along this function, uh, we can now add detail views and section views, but you cannot create the whole view. Yep. Uh, so if you need to, you, you do have to resolve uh, into the full drawing, create those views, and then you exit back out, reload it in detailing mode. Detailing mode is really there to add all your notes and annotations mm -hmm. um, without all that heavy data. So going back to large assembly mode, I mean, here the proof is in the pudding. Uh, we ran the uh, six assemblies with large assembly mode on and off, ranging from what, 5,000 components to 50,000 components? Yeah, I think our smaller one's actually around 1,500 components. Oh, 1,500, that's right. Um, up to up to about 30,000 components. Um, and we can see there that in the smaller models and the low, lower end of uh, the spectrum, uh, you're not going to see as dramatic of effects. But it's still a percentage. Absolutely. But when you get up into some of those larger models and we, we see more and more of our customers getting into the 4,000, 5,000, that's a 10,000 uh, range, uh, we, we see a very significant, I mean, that's almost uh, almost a 50% improvement um, yep. with, with the uh, large assembly mode on. And that has no extra time on your, your part. I mean, all you have to do is make sure that that tool is on. So with that, I, I, we button up at the end here. I, Brian and I would personally like to thank the guys over at Dell, Box Technologies, AMD, NVIDIA, have a great partnership with, with all these guys. They've been helping us out, getting ready for, for 3D Experience World in February, um, giving even more hardware for Brian to test. <laughs> so more, more computers to flow into your home so your wife will look at you funny. But... Um, we're gonna open it up for any questions. We'll stick around for a couple minutes, but we really appreciate your time. Um, listen to the dulcet tones of Brian and Bob. Um, we're gonna do more of these, so we hope you found some value in it. And um, tell a friend, um, this, this has been recorded, so it will be up on our, I believe on our YouTube channel, CTI yeah. channel. So feel free to visit us again. And if, if you need something like a computer, um, we've, we've worked with Dell and curated uh, some pretty easy to look at machines that you don't have a ton of options to have to go through. We curated just the ones that we thought worked well for SOLIDWORKS users. So that's at www.dell.com slash C-A-T-I. But feel free to uh, contact us uh, with any of your hardware uh, questions. Our support team's here um, to help you out. So, Chris, do we have any questions flow in? Holy cow, guys, we have had a ton of questions. I my audio back on. I was hearing an echo earlier. Uh, I've been answering many offline, but there's a couple that I've, I've held off on because I want to answer them with the entire group. I think these are some questions that the whole attendee list can, can get something good out of. So, Sure, go ahead. What about components that are hidden? Do hidden components still negatively impact graphical display performance? Yes. Yes. Sim simple answer. Yes. They Perfect. are hidden components are just turned off. They're hidden. They're no. they're there. They're not. They're uh, you're just not looking at them, uh, and, and that is different than suppressing. So when you suppress a component, you're telling Zowers to skip over it. Don't load that data. Uh, when when you're just hiding and showing that data, that model is there. You're just not looking at it graphically. Now there there is one small caveat to that, and 
you have to make the decision when you open. So if you know someone's hidden some components, you can say do not load hidden components, but that basically treats that like it's a suppressed component in the first place. So that is, is kind of a, a loaded one here. So if I say file open and I click on an assembly here, there is load hidden components. If I uncheck that, it will not load the hidden components, but it's it treats it like it's suppressed. So, but later on, there's there's no way to retroactively turn that on. Good question, Chris. Yeah, thank, that's why I wanted to to get it answered live. I thank you, Brian, for really talking about the difference between hidden versus suppressed components. I know in my experience that gets mixed up quite a bit. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, another one that came in here. Any tips on top down or imparted imported part reference performance increases? I, I know we could go we could go on forever on that one. Yeah, no, that's definitely a tough one. Uh, external references uh, definitely can add into uh, solve times. Um, and it, it general rules it, it, it loosely is, is minimize the external referencing. Um, a lot of it just depends on, yeah, a lot of it's situational, depends on what you're trying to do. Yeah. I mean, it, it really does depend on if you're trying to treat that assembly as a master model, like one is always gonna control the other, or if you're just throwing a component into the assembly, you're like, I need that hole right now where it's located. Well, in assembly mode, you can come in and you can tell it when I when I create a new component in the assembly or I edit a component, do not create the external references. So it really does depend on how you want to go about doing it. Yeah, I, I certainly run across some recently where people were putting fasteners in as an imported part and then just chopping them. Uh, <laughs> so if it's some very, very minor adjustments, uh, but now we're, now we're carrying external references. Yeah, so, so you definitely want to be careful with that. What about envelope components? They, uh, oh. they any lighter? <laughs> exactly. They any lighter in our assemblies, or is it all for show? That's that's really kind of a good question. Um, en envelopes recently just got a big overhaul. Um, we might have to really kind of revisit that one. I I I will I will say the I I'm one of those people that I I will I will tell you at the end of the day unless I've done it myself it's vapor. Um, personally, I haven't tested it using our benchmark tool. Um, I will be putting in um, those references in there. One of the things I like about it is the fact that it does not create circular references. It does not create those, what we consider in context relationships and it should perform better. Do I have quantitative numbers that, that say that? No, I do not. No, but we're going to scribble that down and add it to the list. He's, he's telling me right now. He's actually pointing at my pad of paper. Um, I, I definitely have looked at what they've done, and I, I'm impressed, but we have not been able to get to that in our testing. Well, I can I can tell you that I've, I've seen some models with a lot of envelopes, and those envelope models, uh, unless you load the assembly with those envelopes hidden, um, and those hidden components not actually loaded, they will still show up in the graphical list under in, uh, in excuse me, inside a visualization. So yes, top level, my opinion, they still will cause a pretty significant hit to your assembly. It's not like they're completely gone or anything like that. Yeah, I think I think the big thing was was the external reference issues that people were experiencing, inserting an assembly into an assembly into an assembly, and duplicating the assemblies and. Yeah, a lot of stuff. We've seen a lot of that where we had duplicate assemblies stuck into the top level. Yes. Yeah, some of some of our large customers had that. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're not gonna go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're definitely getting a lot of questions coming in. We're getting a lot of ideas for other webinars, which is great. Uh let's see here something that can benefit everyone. Here's a couple. Uh 
I'll, I'll read them off both and let you guys have at it. What about our virtual parts? Do they cause slow performance? And do assembly features cause performance issues? So assembly features, I'll take that one. Um, assembly features is an external reference. So the, the big thing there is when, when that, that part file loads up, it's gonna try to rectify, is that assembly open? And um, that, that still can cause opening and, and, and some slowness. So personally, if I was gonna do assembly features that propagated, I would make sure I propagate it into a part. And personally, I, I, I'd rather get rid of that reference after the fact because, I mean, that's, that's just my it, personal opinion. <laughs> It really yeah, but there's definitely there's definitely design advantages to it um, because keeping the things like holes, keeping those aligned, yep. um, especially early, especially earlier in the design yarn, the R and D end, um, where where that model constantly changes. Um, that's that's the power of the top down design, keeping keeping those important relationships. But again, I think it's just being cognizant and aware of what you are doing and how many. Um, and then sometimes even multiple external references to the same component. Yep. Um, so when, when it comes to like doing top-down design, the, the biggest thing that I can recommend is making sure that those external references try to flow to one location or flow in one way. Because once you start getting yourself into a situation where somehow um, it's overlapping on itself or it's referring to a part that's next to it. That's when you start getting external references that start doing circular referencing. And that's where rebuild times have to cycle multiple times to get clean. So you have to be careful with that. Um, the virtual components, um, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off there, Brian, but we're, we're, we're low on time. Um, the virtual components, I mean, you're just basically putting the component inside the assembly. So it's gonna load with the assembly, it's just not an external file. So it's gonna be treated very much like a, a part, it's just you're not gonna be able to get to that part without the assembly itself is, is the big thing there. Yeah, so that creates a temp file on the user's machine. Yep. Um, so you, sometimes you do have to watch out, sometimes either in PDM or going into sending that file to somebody else because it's actually looking for that temp file buried in your app yeah. data. Um, so sometimes we can have some issues with that, um, but certainly various PDM systems can can have different requirements on, on whether they like that or not. So I got maybe another th three minutes. I got, a, I got a hard stop here at uh, 2.15. Um, so wh what else do we have here, Chris? That's what I'm looking. I'm looking to see if there's one thing that could kind of be beneficial to all. There's several that are very, very specific. Some of these we'll have to handle offline to the attendees that are still there. Might need a few more details. Okay. Um, what about equations? Getting a couple of questions about uh, top level assembly equations. Are they going to cause problems? Circular reference warnings in equations. Anything, you know, any opinions on, on top level assembly equations? So with, with equations, it, and sometimes equations are, are brought over from multiple, multiple years of use. Um, they add an enhancement into equations where it can detect the circular references. And if it is possible, we'll reorder the solve order of the equations so there isn't a circular reference. In some situations, it's still impossible to not have the circular reference just based upon how the equations were written. Um, but we have seen where a number of, number of equations can impact performance of a part. Um, when I do my, my evaluation tool, one of the first things I wrote for it to go grab is how many equations are actually inside that part file. So, I mean, it's definitely something that at a certain point is, do I use equations or do I start using a design table to govern it as well? So it's it's definitely one of those, Brian, I don't know how much more insight you've got with equations. No, it's just, uh, they've added 
capability of tying them to configurations. So it, it really is kind of pretty elaborate uh, topic in itself. Yep. I mean, we could, we could probably have a 15 minute conversation on equations, un unfortunately. The, right, the short I have another is, webcast on it. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the short, short end of the stick on this is yes, number of equations inside of a part file or an okay. assembly file will affect your performance. Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. I think I think we'll wrap it up. Um, I know there are more equation or excuse me, equations, more questions <laughs> in the list. Got me thinking you're, equations you're, now. You're uh, computing questions in your head. Uh, to those of you that are still online, I just sent out my email address. If you feel you didn't get your question answered or we missed it or maybe you want to talk deeper, send it in to me. There's my contact info, chris.dubuke at cati.com. I will direct it where needed. I will download the question list, go through them after the fact. Um, but gentlemen, thank you so much. I learned a lot. I can tell based on the questions, our attendees learned a lot, a good way to wrap up the year. Again, thank you so much. Hey, no problem. We're gonna do more of this for you guys and we hope you you enjoyed it. If if you did, if, if nothing else, send, send Chris over an email and said we did a good job. So, um, if if we don't talk to any of you, we 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 thank you for for attending today. Um, this is Brian and I. This is our livelihood, and without customers like you attending and being our partners, um, we want to do what we do on a regular basis. So we want to thank you for that. Um, once again, don't forget the shameless plug for um, 3D Experience World. Um, because we will be there in Atlanta, February 6th through the 9th. Um, not only talking about this, but Brian's got, I think, two other presentations he's doing as well um, on, on performance. So feel free to give us a ring and we'll, we'll see what we can do to help you out, guys. So. Excellent. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for all the attendees. Have a great rest of your year. Hope to see you next year in another webcast. And yeah, everyone take care until next time. Thank you so much.